we are planning in, in this study to you know have a crack at what's the real challenge isn't it uh you know hosea uh, there's 14 chapters and um you know almost every verse is a challenge at times and it's trying to get our, our heads around but uh we hope that in these studies and the discussions that we have together we might feel that we can make some progress and, and get to know uh god that little bit better so hosea means and pencils at the ready now salvation and we'll see how god's great plan will eventually bring salvation to both jews and to gentiles uh, the promises that god made to abraham will come true we see from verse one of the the prophecy that hosea it begins by telling us the length of hosea's time prophesying through using the kings of judah um he, he was certainly prophesying through the uh let's see if i can make this work apologies that's i'm just running out of batteries so if anyone does happen to have any other batteries we just try the kind of uh the the classic give them a rub give them a blow <laughs> okay uh obviously if this does work now you're all gonna suddenly think to themselves oh wow no not a chance okay <laughs> it, it is uh it's kind of lighting up here but anyway not to worry we can click oh no it's just we're just stuck okay great so you've seen this uh this before i'm sure um and we realized that you know hosea up here he, he's prophesying through the second half of the 8th century bc and you might notice from your margin as well if you just look in your margin against hosea 1 verse 1 that he overlaps amos uh, it was another prophet concerned with the northern kingdom of israel which is hosea's focus too if we zoom in a little bit uh, we'll see that the Assyrian power is looming large in Hosea's time. Hosea's message most certainly has relevance to the, the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, he overlaps Micah and Isaiah who are focusing in the south. But we're confident that Hosea's message is predominantly aimed at, at Israel. And the reason we say that is really kind of quite easy judah yes it is mentioned it's mentioned 15 times but israel is mentioned 44 times and ephraim the dominant tribe of the north is mentioned 37 times in terms of key references for the historical record the first one you need is 2 kings 14 and verse 23 and again it's probably in your margin so so just kind of circle it when when you see it there and that's when jeroboam the second so jeroboam the first was the, the first king when the kingdom split wasn't he um you had jeroboam in the north rehoboam in the south this is jeroboam the second and he when he comes onto the throne that's the kind of the boundary point for Hosea beginning his reign. He, he reigned for a long time. So we'd suggest that actually Hosea uh, starts prophesying perhaps, you know, in the last 10 years or so of Jeroboam's reign. And we know that then we go through to at least 2 Kings 18 when Hezekiah started to reign. It was a time of prosperity. Judah was prosperous in, in the south under Uzziah. Uh, it said, doesn't it? He, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And if you read 2 Kings 26, you realize just how prosperous the, the southern kingdom was under Isaiah. But so too, with Jeroboam, uh, king in the north, the northern kingdom thrived materially and regained boundaries. But an affluent society does not make for a godly one. And we learn from Amos. Remember that Amos has overlapped Hosea, that there was serious social injustice in Israel, particularly among the, the wealthy and the powerful. And so the words of the Lord Jesus come to mind that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. An affluent society seems to be a society where people have very little time for God. And that hits us, doesn't it, in terms of the society in which we live. Well, with that in mind, let's focus in on Hosea. Hosea was asked by God to marry a woman named Gomer, 
who God knew would go off and commit adultery. And it would suggest that she becomes a prostitute essentially after they marry. Now, Gomer's name means complete, which may suggest that all is well, complete as it were, when they marry. And she's the daughter, we learn in verse 3, of Diblaim, which means two cakes of figs. Now, cake can be translated lump. It, it might simply be almost like a cluster of figs. But the fact that in the Hebrew it's two is interesting because the focus throughout Hosea is on Ephraim, this dominant tribe in the north. And Ephraim, as I've put there, means double fruitfulness. Gomer, like Ephraim, was in a privileged position. But instead of bringing forth fruit for God, they focused on their own pleasures. So we read in Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land doth commit great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So chapter 1, we believe, is very much an overview of what happened. Hence, God could say, go and take thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. The record, I believe, is showing what they'll become. And to begin with, we believe all is well. In fact, we know that to begin with, Hosea and Gomer have a child together. Verse 3, uh, he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. Underline the him, bare him a son. Uh, we realize from verse 4, the son is named Jezreel, which has a double meaning. Jezreel can mean God scatters or God sows. And you can see in a sense that the two are completely related, you know, the, the scattering of seed. God sows, God scatters. And we plunge into, in verse 4, the bluntness of Hosea's message. The Lord said unto him, call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. The kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, is coming to an end, and Israel will be scattered by God through the nations. Now, if Hosea started prophesying, say, in the last 10 years of Jeroboam, by doing just a little bit of maths, we get a sense of how long it is until the Assyrians come against the capital city of the northern kingdom, Samaria, and take Israel, that, those people, into captivity. It'd be around 50 years or so later if Hosea started in the sort of final 10 years of Jeroboam. So Hosea is prophesying for a long time. But, but understandably, when we read verse 4, we can find it a bit strange. So having been told that he should call his son Jezreel, Jezreel is then born, God says he will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. I don't, do not blame you if you're looking at it thinking, what does this mean? Well, we're being forced to stop and think about the significance of the name Jezreel. You see, Jezreel was also the name of a place. Let's get this clear now. Jezreel is the name of a place. The place where Jehu, an earlier king, you can see, just count back up from Jeroboam, an earlier king, Jehu, shed blood in Jezreel. And what's happening here is in verse 4, God is giving Hosea a short-term prophecy that he's able to, to give to the people so that they can trust that he is indeed a prophet of Yahweh. So let's try and understand this short-term prophecy in verse 4. Before the kingdom of Israel comes to an end, but to prove that it is doomed, 
God says he will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. So Hosea is prophesying that the house of Jehu, so this is the house of Jehu, Jehu had a son Jehu Ahaz, who had a son Jehoash, who had a son Jeroboam, who had a son Zechariah. That is the house of Jehu. And what we're going to see is that God is prophesying through Hosea that the house of Jehu, his dynasty, would come to an end. Now this happens, so here's the cross-reference for this, in 2 Kings 15 and verse 10, where Shalom, who is not one of their, Jehu's great-great-grandchildren, Shalom is just a random, as it were, murders Jehu's great-grandson, Zechariah, and puts himself on the throne. However, Jehu did more than he should have done. And this is what's going to come out here. You see, this happened in Jezreel. In Jezreel, Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram. So we're now going back in history to what Jehu did. What is it that Jehu did that's now going to be avenged in the time of Hosea. So go back to the time, so we're going back now to 2 Kings 9. It was in Jezreel, this is the point, that Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram. Now, this was a good thing that Jehu did. In fact, he was commanded to do this by one of the sons of the prophets sent by Elisha, who said to him, to the son of the prophets, go and tell Jehu to deal with the house of Ahab. Joram, is Ahab and Jezebel's son. So Jehu does this. But Jehu seems to relish in this role of being somebody that can go and, and cut off the, the king's house. And so it turns into a full-on massacre with Jehu. Not, not only does he take out Joram, the house of Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and, and the prophets of Baal, which, as we say, is a really good thing that he did, he also decided to go and kill King Ahaziah of Judah and 42 of his relatives. So, so I want you to note that Jehu went beyond what he should have done. Okay, He was told by the prophet, by Elisha, the servant of the prophet, he said, go and deal with the house of Ahab. He did do that in killing Joram. And, and that was a good thing. But he then seemed to go too far. He decided to then go off and kill others too. He king, killed King Ahaziah. If Judah King Ahaziah was a bad king, so in a way you sort of think, oh, well, surely it was okay. But that wasn't what he was asked to do. Okay? It wasn't his role to, to kill the, you know, Ahaziah was of the, the line of David. He, he shouldn't have done that. And so he stepped over the line. But I want you to notice too that he did this in Iblim. Now, I suddenly feel like uh, the noise has gone from here. Is that good for you, Luke? You know? Or are there going to be people online who are going to be saying, we can't hear a thing anymore? They can hear. Great. Okay. So, um, so we want to note that Jehu killed Ahaziah by Iblim. Okay. Now, I'm not showing you this on the map, but you, you can look this up in your own time. <coughs> Iblim is located on the south side of the Valley of Jezreel. Okay. So those of you who have been to Israel, you know, you picture Galilee, no problem at all. Head, head just a little bit left, a little bit south, you've got the Valley of Jezreel, the breadbasket of Israel, you know, this, this amazing big valley where things like grew in, in abundance. And it was there that uh, Jehu started his massacre, and there he, he um, killed Ahaziah too in Iblim. Now, just hold on to that, because I think that might have some significance. So, what we've picked up is that Jehu had a command to deal with the house of Ahab but he went too far in killing the king of Judah too. He didn't respect the Lord's command. And it was told that his sons would sit on the throne in Israel until the fourth generation. So that's there in 2 Kings 10 and verse 13, 31. So G was told, your children, your sons will sit until the fourth generation on the throne. <coughs> In Hosea's day, that time was coming to an end. 
Jeroboam was Jehu's grandson. He was the third generation. His son would be the fourth generation. And Hosea was now saying, that time is coming. He is going to die. And that fulfillment came when Shalom assassinated King Zechariah, the fourth child. Okay? Jehu's dynasty was coming to an end. It came to an end forever. Now, rather strangely, I just point this out because I just thought it was interesting. According to the Septuagint, and some modern translations have just kind of adopted this, and so I'm not kind of trying to make some big thing of this at all, but I just think it is interesting that if you read a modern translation, it says that happened in Iblim, the very place that it started in the south of Jezreel. And it's also interesting to note, if you just look at verse 5 of Hosea 1, that God says, I will break the bow of Jezreel of Israel in the valley of Jezreel I would just think again it's interesting that it was with the bow that Jehu went to to sort of bring that vengeance that's how it started well the key point is this the house of Jehu would be a cameo of Israel they had gone away from God Uh, the divine record says of Jehu that he took no heed to walk in the law of Yahweh, the God of Israel, with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. That's, of course, Jeroboam the first. That's what Jehu became like. Now, yes, he did know what God's bidding at the beginning with, but it's almost like he just relished in going off and killing people. Actually, once that was over, he took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord. And that is what Israel were being like as a nation. Jehu sowed violence and destruction. His house would reap the same end. Four generations later, his great grandson Zechariah was reigning and was murdered by Shalom, possibly in exactly the place that Jehu had started his massacre. And so the proof was there for all to see. As Hosea spoke these words, Hosea was indeed a prophet of Yahweh. What he was saying would come to pass, would surely happen. The kingdom of Israel was coming to its end. Why? Because they had gone astray from God. They had stopped taking heed to his word. And we see that in Goma. She had gone astray from Hosea. She had left that marriage, gone after other lovers, the same uh, Hebrew word there, walked after other people, not walking after the law of the Lord, forgotten the law of my God, Israel says of Israel. So Hosea was told by God to name Gomer's next two children, Loruhama, in verse 6. Call her name Lo Ruhama. This is Gomer's next child. And what we'd suggest is that this is not Hosea's child. Where it said, and I said to you, didn't I? Underline, it says in verse 3, she conceived and bare him a son, Jezreel. Now you'll see that Lo Ruhama, verse 6, this daughter, is not Hosea's child. And the next child is a son, Lo-Ami, verse 9. It is not Hosea's child. In fact, we can say that with some confidence. Just look to chapter 2 now. Verse 2, plead with, so Jezreel's told, plead with your mother, plead, for she's not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her nakedness, set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst and i will not have mercy upon her children for they be the children of whoredoms their mother has played the harlot she has conceived them that have done shamefully she said i will go after my lovers that give me my bread my water my wool my flax my oil and my drink 
So do you see these children, Loruhama and Loami, they are the children of whoredoms. At least one of them may well have had a Gentile father. Clearly though, like Isaiah's children, Hosea's children's names represent the state of Israel in his day. The phrase, looking back to chapter 1 and verse 9, Loami, for, so it says, call his name Loami, for you are not my people. It's what Loami means, not my people, and I will not be your God. And we see that it's a reversal of God's pledge to Israel in Exodus 6 and verse 7. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The name strikes at the heart of the covenant that God had made with Israel at Sinai. Because of his special relationship with them, he would deliver them. But now that relationship is over. Judgment is going to come against Israel. The reality is that Israel had been acting like it had for some time, acting like it had no relationship with God. They were not acting as God's children should have done, imitating God, showing his character in their lives, nor were they treating God as their God. Instead, they were going after Baal and the idols, just wooden stone nonsense that the the nations around them would have worshipped. As a nation, God had been merciful to them time and time again. They were his people. But their their behavior sorry, meant that, that God would stop being merciful to them and treat them as if they weren't his people. God's withdrawal of his mercy so that they're no longer deemed his people was clearly God saying, They are like Gentiles. And we can say that with some certainty. Because to not be God's people, to be a Gentile, it says in Deuteronomy 32, I will move them, Israel, to jealousy with those which are not a people. That is 100% talking of Gentiles. And the Hebrew, Bilo Am, Lo Ami. Israel depended on God showing mercy to them. It depended on God being willing to call them his people. Of course, we realize from Hosea that God's purpose with Israel means that they will once again be his people. They will once again be the sons of the living God, as it says in verse 10. And verse 10 is now looking way ahead into the future, a time we haven't got to. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. The promise is to Abraham. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you're not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. But in Hosea's time, yes, there is a time coming when Israel will be restored. But in Hosea's time, what he was having to tell them is your behavior has taken you so far from God who's loved you and done everything for you because you do not want that relationship. Because you're pushing away from God, you will no longer be God's people. You will be like Gentiles. And I've tried to explain how I think Hosea is describing Israel as Gentiles when God has withdrawn his mercy from them and told them they're not his people. Lo Ruhama, I will not show mercy to you. Lo Ami, you're not my people. I've tried to show how that makes them like Gentiles because it helps to explain Romans 9. Will you come to Romans 9 with me? And this is something that I've struggled a lot with, and I'd love to kind of talk to you about these things as we go through these next few days. But I think this is where I've got to with this. 
Romans 9 is a chapter that demonstrates that God's election is not based around nationality or genealogy. Claiming Abraham to be your father didn't mean that you had a right to God's mercy or a right to be counted as God's people. To be God's people, to receive God's mercy, requires a response to God's word. It requires faith. Romans 9 shows through the examples of Jacob and Esau. Uh, you see them in sort of verse, uh, uh, where can I see them? Uh, verse 12 and 13. Uh, Isaac and Ishmael as well. We should have looked at those first. So you see those in verse 7 and 8. So, so through the examples of Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, and I believe actually through Pharaoh, see him in verse 17, and I think Cyrus in verse 20, I think that we're seeing in those men's examples, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Esau, Pharaoh, Cyrus, the principle that responding to God's word in faith is the only means of salvation. To prove that God's purpose isn't about fleshly descent. Okay, so, you know, Esau, of course, he was a son of Abraham too, but the promise didn't go through him. Ishmael, he was a son of Abraham. The promises didn't go through him. What God wants is a response to his word in faith. And as I say, to prove God's purpose isn't about fleshly descent. The Apostle Paul writes now in verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called, the children of the living God. So we've got two citations from Hosea. First from Hosea 2 in verse 23, you can spot this in your margin. So we see that in verse 25. And also we see the end of verse 25 is carrying on into the next verse of Hosea, which is actually Hosea 3, and verse 1, uh, go yet love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress. So the beloved there, we believe, is uh, referenced into chapter 3 of Hosea and verse 1. Those verses, as we said, are talking about Israel in the future. Despite their waywardness, God would once again reach out to them in his love. Hosea was told, and we'll get to this, to go and find his wife, Gomer. Even though she had gone off, she'd had children with other men, Hosea was still told, you are to go and to find her and to bring her back, to love her again. And so we get there a picture of God's love for his people, Israel. In verse 26, Paul then cites Hosea 1 and verse 10, as I, I put on the screen for you there. There is then a further quotation in verse 27, which is the first half of Hosea 1 and verse 10. But just note this as well. It's also used in Isaiah 10 and verse 22. So uh, verse 27 is from Hosea 1 and verse 10. But just as the, the, um, the apostle writes, Isaiah also cries concerning Israel. So Hosea says this about Israel, verse 27. Isaiah also says the same thing. So you can see that verse 27 of Romans 9 is both from Hosea 1 and from Isaiah. Uh, you've got to kind of make sure that we've kind of picked that up, that there, it's also from Isaiah. But the point I think we can take on these passages is, yes, of course, they're about the Jews. Yes, we know they're about the Jews. And look back to verse 24. The apostle, what nationality was he? He was a Jew. And he says in verse 24, these are speaking of us. Okay, he's a Jew whom he's called. But it's not just about the Jews only. It's also about the Gentiles. Verse 24 seems to me to be saying it's about Jews and Gentiles. So how 
is these passages in Hosea and Isaiah, how are they speaking about Jews as well as Gentiles? Well, I think the answer is because through Hosea, God had been making the point that Israel were like Gentiles. They were not a people, low ami. And if you just look over to Romans 10, Paul reminds the Jews that God's plan and purpose always included Gentiles. And if you look in verse 19, look what he cites. I will provoke you to jealousy, which them which were not a people. And he's quoting Deuteronomy 32 and verse 21. And that passage is the one that we've used below Ami in the Hebrew to say there in Hosea, that's what they were like. They were like Gentiles. So let's pick out something else just from Romans before we go back to Hosea. Paul is going to show as the Lord God inspires him to write, that wonderfully, whether Jews or Gentiles, any who will turn to God, this is going to be one of the key words in Hosea, any who will turn to God can be shown God's mercy. They can become his people. Just look at this, Romans 9 in verse 33. Whosoever, whoever, believes that's the key have faith can be saved will not be put to shame romans 10 verse 4 christ is the end of the law to, of, for righteousness to everyone what they need to do believe have faith romans 10 verse 11 for the scripture saith, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is over all. Sorry, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, with that in our mind, let's go back to Hosea. And we're going to go into Hosea 2, and this is something that we're going to cover a little bit more in our final class, Hosea chapter 2. But I just want you to note now verse 20 this is when in the future israel are brought back into a relationship with god they come into the new covenant and it says in verse 20 i will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the lord what was the key in romans whosoever believes has faith his is the is the greek that's what you've got to have you've got to have faith and we see that eventually israel will come back into a relationship with god but it'll be based on faith well we then read about the way in which that relationship will bring blessings to all and this is again you know why we just rejoice to have the hope of israel because the hope of israel is the hope for the whole world all nations we blessed in abraham so we see in Hosea 2 now, and verse 21, it shall come to pass in that day that I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. The earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that hath not obtained mercy. And I will say to them that were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. And we will cover what those verses mean in a bit more detail later. But I want you to see that God reverses the names of each of Hosea's children. Jezreel, God sows, God scatters. It goes now from the scattering that was going to happen in Hosea's day when the Assyrians took them away and they were scattered to the ends of the earth. To now a people that are regathered, a people that are sown into the earth. And we see that as a really positive thing. The people of God will be planted, rooted, established as God's people in the land. That's true. But sown into the wider world to bring others to the kingdom. And I, I promise you, we will look at that in more detail. Lo Ruhama, the one who had not experienced love or compassion, simply becomes Ruhama. 
because God will now show love to her. Lo Ami, not my people, becomes Ami, as God will claim them as his people. You are my people, and they will say, you are my God. Well, beyond that, in chapter 3, we see this living sign of the prophet, this parallel of God and Israel all the more clearly. Despite Gomer's complete lack of loyalty to Hosea, despite all her unfaithfulness, he goes after her. He redeems her. He brings her back to himself. He takes her again as his wife. So we read in Hosea 3, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who took to other gods and loved flagons of wine. So I brought her to me, I brought her to me for 15 pieces of silver, for an homer of barley and a half homer of barley. I said unto her, thou shalt abide for me many days, thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. We see from the marriage of Hosea to Gomer, a picture of God's love for Israel. Hosea teaches us that God is personally involved in man's salvation. This is the same way God is with his people. Israel rejected God at this time. And we're going to see that clearly in our studies. They chose to be like the nations. They chose to be like Gentiles. They built their relationships with the nations. Yet despite them choosing to reject God's mercy, choosing not to be his people, God is faithful. He reaches out to bring in those who will respond to his word in faith sadly two of the key words in this prophecy are found here whoredoms it's translated there harlot in verse three adulteries adulteress in verse one it comes through particularly strongly in chapter four just come in chapter four and verse nine There shall be like people, like priests, I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom, shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. So do you see how that completely echoes what you see in Hosea 3 and verse 1? What Gomer was like is what the people are like. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. My people ask counsel at the stocks, their staff declareth unto them. But the spirit of whoredoms has caused them to err. They've gone a whoring from under their God. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spouses shall commit adultery. You see it in verse 14, whoredom, adultery, whores. Verse 15, play the harlot. Verse 16, they committed Whoredom. See what a key word that is. I also want you to see why this has happened. It's happened because there's a major lack of understanding. It's knowledge, of course, that brings understanding. So the end of verse 14, the people that does not understand shall fall. So their understanding comes from knowing. And that this first point is what's missing. Knowledge has gone. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no tr truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee. And, and the word knowledge, as I've put there on the screen, is also a key word in this prophecy. And the word knowledge is about knowing, not simply in the sense of knowing about, but actually knowing someone. You'll also realize the verb to know 
can be used in the most intimate sense. For example, Adam knew his wife Eve. So when we read in chapter 5 and verse 3, I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hid from me. For now, o Ephraim, thou hast committed whoredom, and Israel is defiled. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. We get the sense that God has done everything to love Ephraim. Yet Ephraim has gone away from God. And another important word in the prophecy is the word covenant. It comes five times. We'll just pick out two. Chapter 6 and verse 7. They, Ephraim, this dominant tribe in the north, they, like Adam, men, have transgressed the covenant. Or, or, or chapter 8 and verse 1. Set the trumpet to thy mouth, he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. Okay, so judgment's coming because they transgressed my covenant. Covenant, a key word. At Sinai, God made a covenant with Israel regarding the fact that they would uphold his law and therefore be his special people. But Israel were going away from God. They had clearly broken the covenant that had been made and instead were making new covenants with other gods and nations. So, for example, in chapter 12 and verse 1, it says they make a covenant with the Assyrians. So rather than stay loyal to God, they're going off now. They've broken the covenant with God and now happy to make covenants with other lovers. The final key word that we'd like to just bring out now is the word love. And sadly, every occurrence in Hosea of the word love in relation to Israel's love is not about their love of God. Every single one. God's love for Israel is there. We see the word used in God's love to Israel, but every time it talks about Israel's love, it's talking about their love of others, not their love of God. When we add that into these key words that we've looked at, adultery, harlot, knowing, covenant, we realize how far astray they were from God. Their spiritual adultery led to literal adultery. In other words, their rejection of God meant that they were spiritual adulterers. What we see is because they'd broken the covenant, gone to other nations, served other gods, that led to horrific moral decline, adultery, lies, stealing, murder. The tragedy of seeing people go away from God is it leads to destruction. Take that point home. Going away from God leads to moral destruction. Seeing this through Hosea puts a lens on the incredible, almost unfathomable, fathomable depth of God's love. Come back to chapter three again. Let's make sure that we see this. In Hosea's relationship with Goma, we're being taught about God's love. That is why we're studying this. We're being taught about the love of Yahweh. Then said Yahweh unto me, go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who took to other gods and loved flagons of wine. That's the love that we're looking at. What an immense privilege for us to have this record and learn that God is like a rock, always there, willing to reach out, full of love. We see that he won't tolerate sin. The severity of God is going to be seen as he brings judgment upon the nation. Verse 4, the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, 
without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without teraphim, many days. We know that Israel will be scattered. But God's goodness is abundant. His purpose will be never thwarted. Afterward, it says in verse 5, shall the children of Israel return? A time is coming, brothers and sisters, when Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. David, I'm sure you know, means beloved. Here we have a lovely picture of the Messiah, the beloved. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ being their king. And this isn't the only connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come forward finally to Hosea chapter 11. We read of God's love for his people Israel again. He cared for them as his son. When Israel was a child, Hosea 11 verse 1, when he was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. He called him to leave Egypt behind. But verse 2, as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Baalim and burned incense to graven images. At every call, Israel was disloyal to God, despite God from the beginning taking them out of Egypt, looking to get rid of the flesh, moving them away from that. Yet for them, every call, they were willing to be disloyal to God. But God kept working to support them. Verse 3, I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms. But they knew not that I healed them. And you picture God as a father, like a child, you know, when you've got that lush thing that you see every now and again. We might even see it this week with, you know, some dad. And the, the child kind of reaching up and the dad just holding his fingers and the child holding on, just being able to take those steps. I taught Ephraim to go, taking them by their arms. But they, they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man. I brought them in with bands of love. I was to them that take off the yoke on their jaws. I laid meat unto them. I'm the one who took away the things that were pulling them down. I set food before them. God had done so much. He took away their hardships, put food before them. But in all this, it says in verse five, they refused to return. It says in verse seven, they are bent on backsliding from me. But still, God says in verse eight, how shall I give the up Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Admar? How shall I set thee as the Bowen to the peripheries of Sodom and Gomorrah? God doesn't want to destroy them as he destroyed that place. My heart is turned within me. My repenting, my compassions are kindled together. We see God's compassion for his people. God doesn't want to give Israel up. And he doesn't. And although Israel didn't love God in the way that he loved them, God would send a saviour, Hoshea, Yahshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he would show to Israel and indeed to the world what God wanted from his son. He would show what it is to be called out of Egypt. It's to reject the flesh and to stay loyal to his father. He would overcome where Israel failed. And incredibly, in his love, we see God's love to open up salvation to both the Jews and to the Gentiles. And so, brothers and sisters, what can we learn? Well, surely we should be willing to take heed to God's word, what Jehu didn't do, what Israel were not doing. To do that, we need knowledge of God to make our relationship last. Recognize other relationships, going away from God is wrong. And spiritual adultery leads to moral decline. 
Remember, God won't tolerate sin. Come to God in faith. He's willing to show mercy and he wants us to be his people. Ruhama, Ami. God has done everything to offer salvation. May we fellowship with his son by coming out of Egypt, rejecting the world and the thinking of the flesh and stay close to the God who has loved us.